What is up, freaks? It's your boy Marty Bent here to introduce this episode of Tales from the Crypt. It is yet another crossover episode with the Great American Mining Podcast. I sat down with Meredith Angwin, author of Shorting the Grid, a book about the fragility of our grid systems throughout the, the country, people's misunderstandings around how grids work, how electricity is delivered, the sources of that electricity the mix that we should be using, the mix we are using, and just bad policy around this. I think this episode is very, very important to cross-pollinate with TFTC because it just adds to another data point and proves that there's a lot of misconceptions in the world. A bunch of people taking things at face value, taking what the media tells them and running with it. Considering what happened in New York State, last week, late last week, with the decommissioning of their nuclear power plant on the Hudson due to some very, very uh, just completely misguided reasons. Just call them what they are, misguided reasons. Being pushed by a bunch of anti-human individuals who just want to make your electricity prices more expensive and make your electricity delivery less reliable. The world has gone mad. Project Veritas, they said, CNN, they caught CNN in a little catch-22. You know what the next big, big scare is after COVID? Climate, climate crisis, climate change, New York State today. (laughs) They're shooting themselves in the foot. They decommissioned this power plant last week, and then today there's, it became apparent that there's a, a now a bill on the floor in New York State to, to put a three-year moratorium on on Bitcoin mining within the state because it is uh, it's bad for the environment. Too much electricity. These people don't know how the environment works. They don't know how electricity delivery works. They don't understand anything. And Meredith, who's an incredible woman up in New- Vermont, she's a, a strong nuclear energy advocate, as everybody should be, um, she she highlights in her book shorting the grid and just common misconceptions around energy delivery specifically and the forces behind it the lobbying forces behind it a bunch of idiots who have the ears of politicians who are doing things that are going to make again energy less reliable energy delivery less reliable and more expensive hurts poor people the most it's a racist and classist movement here to move us to unreliable energy sources. <sighs> I think you guys are going to like this one. It's brought to you by our good friends at the motherfucking Cash App. Cash App, somebody stack sats, send sets, receive sets, sell sets. If you so please, we're saying sats, 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 because sats are the standard. There are 100 million sats in one Bitcoin you don't have to stack a whole Bitcoin. You don't have to stack a fraction of a Bitcoin if you don't want to. You can change that unit bias and stack whole sats, thousands of sats. Right now, one cuck buck is going to get you 1,864 sats. So, yeah, spend a cuck buck. Get over 1,800 sats. It seems like an incredible deal right now considering Bitcoin's potential to be widely adopted. You can do more on the Cash App. You can... Get paychecks direct deposited into the app. They offer account numbers, rallying numbers. They have their boost program, which allows you to get a debit card, except anywhere Visa is accepted. You go to partner merchants or just go to any merchant, swipe your card, and you get cash or sats back, depending on the particular boost. Or just get a discount. You can just call that cash back or sats back if you want to. Um, what else do we got here? That's about it. Download the cash app. Use the code stacking sats when you do. It's S-T-A-C-K-I-N-G-S-A-T-S. You're going to get $10. $10 is going to go to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. That's Owls Lacrosse. <laughs> Owls Lacrosse. This rip was also brought to you by our good friends at Hoddle Hoddle. Hoddle Hoddle is here to provide you freaks with a lending platform. Lend.hoddlehoddle.com. That's lend.hoddlehoddle.com. Okay? And what they're going to do here is they're giving you the ability to leverage Bitcoin's native properties, particularly its multi-sig properties, to get non-custodial Bitcoin back lending. allows peer-to-peer lending, so there's no KYC, no AML. United States customers, this is available to you. First product at HODL HODL available to you. 
That's because it's not custodial. You meet on this lending p- platform. It's peer to peer, global, anonymous. You set your own terms. So if you're short funds, you don't want to sell your Bitcoin, get some liquidity by borrowing using your Bitcoin as collateral on the lend.hodlhodl.com platform. What you do is you put your Bitcoin up in a multi sig escrow. You hold one key, your counterparty holds the other key, another key, and Hoddle Hoddle's there to hold a third key. If there's any dispute that needs to be resolved. Again, you don't trust anybody with your funds. You always have sight into them so that you know that your sats aren't being re hypothecated. Um, and then on the other side of that, if you have stable coins laying around, you're looking to earn some returns, you can enter the other side of that order book, put your stable coins up to be lent out at an interest rate. That's how that works. So create your own offers and set your own terms again at lend.hodlhodl.com. That's lend.hodlhodl.com. We'll link to that in the show notes. This rip was also brought to you by Compass Mining. Compass Mining is here for you, freaks. They want to get you into the mining game and the way they do that is you go to compassmining.io, C-O-M-P-A-S-S-M-I-N-I-N-G.io. You find a miner that they're selling. You pick a mining model. We'll show you the price. You buy the miner. Then you pick a hosting facility, the competitive electricity cost. You pick a hosting facility. They get the miner. They plug it in at the hosting facility, and they start streaming you sats that are mined by that miner <clears throat> to a wallet of your choice. Again, they want to democratize mining. They want to get individuals involved. Uh, they're working on the manufacturing side to get deals with minor manufacturers, ASIC manufacturers, and then on the hosting side to get favorable deals with hosting providers so that you can mine competitively. You don't have to pay twenty cents a kilowatt hour, especially if you're in New York State. If you're in New York State and they're decommissioning your nuclear power plant and you're you're thinking about mining at your house, if that price is about to go up, you probably need Compass Mining. So go to compassmining.io, C-O-M-P-A-S-S-M-I-N-I-N-G.io. Check out everything they have going on. Again, trying to make this as easy as possible for you freaks. And last but not least, we got our good friends at Brains, B-R-A-I-I-N-S.com. That's a double I. They got Edward Evenson there. They're calling him Ed Sin Queso. Sin Queso Evenson. Because he doesn't like that cheese. Sin Queso. Imagine being... Being the guy in Mexico trying to enjoy the local fare, and you you have to be the one, that asshole, at every meal orders. Hola, puedo tener un burrito de carne asada con todo sin queso. It's yeah, <laughs> that would be embarrassing. Well, anyway, Ed does work for Brains, and Brains is doing incredible things uh, for the Bitcoin community, for the mining community at large, specifically. As you freaks know, um, they are. Uh, the team behind Slush Pool, and uh, they've got some new products out for you freaks too. I'm searching, 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 searching. They've got their new miner farm manager. Let me find the document here. This is uh, this is Tales from the Crypt preparation here. Just want to make sure I'm getting it right, Daniel. Sorry for slowing it up. <laughs> Sin queso, lo siento. Checking, checking, checking notes. Checking notes. Yeah. So they just released the Brains OS Plus 21.04 update. It's an update for Antminer S9s, which enables miners to connect to our new AS- to their new ASIC farm monitoring and management solution, Brains OS Plus Manager. The release also includes following bug fix, fixed an issue with long reconnect to pools. All right, so this is a Brains OS Plus update. That they've got out there. They've got this new mining manager. Uh, Slush Pool is getting a new major update soon. I mentioned that uh, a couple of weeks ago, or last episodes. Ad read. Jumped the gun there. Sorry, guys. Um, but now this, this and I jumped the gun with the mining farm manager too, but now that is live. Brains OS Plus manager and online platform enables miners to remotely monitor and manage all their ASICs running Brains OS Plus can help you improve uptime, get your farms running optimally without needing to be on site 24-7. It's a credible thing if you're a miner. Less stress. Stack more sats with Brains OS Plus and do so with less stress. The managers and always will be free for Brains OS Plus miners, and they can connect an unlimited number of devices. You can monitor it on your phone, your computer, whatever it may be. Security and 
where top priorities brains os plus manager uses stratum v2 for smaller and less frequent data transfers with all ASIC configuration and telemetry data being sent via encrypted connections, which protect against eavesdropping and man in the middle attacks. For details on the manager, how to set it up, your mining operation, go to brains, that's B R A I I N S dot com slash blog, and check out the Brains OS Plus Manager Launch article. That's Brains, B R A I I N S dot com. Hope you freaks enjoy this rip with Meredith. She's an incredible woman. She's wise, too. She's got wisdom. She's been around the block. She's been around electricity grids and, and the concept of energy for quite a while. She comes with a chemistry background. There's a bunch of stupid people in charge, freaks. Beware. Dickie. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. Probably should be. Probably should be. Probably should be. Welcome back to Gamcast. It's Marty Bent here on a beautiful... What's today? Wednesday. Wednesday afternoon where I am and where you are too. Correct, Marit? Yes. Yeah, I'm in, uh, I'm in Vermont. <laughs> so sitting down with Meredith Angwin, author of Shorting the Grid, The Hidden Fragility of Our Electric Grid, to talk about electric grids. Maybe we'll get into Bitcoin at some point, but I think this topic of electric grids, uh, particularly most people's misunderstanding of how important they are, how they work, and how energy actually get delivered and the fragility of of some of our grids across the United States, particularly, um, that's sort of what I want to talk talk about today and jump into that, particularly uh, in the midst of what happened in Austin, Texas, and the rolling blackouts and brownouts that, that we see in California as they've de- decommissioned um, some of their uh, power plants, particularly nuclear and that gas. Um, so I, I guess just to jump into it, let's talk a little bit about the book, why you wrote it. And, and the topics that it covers and, and the things it's trying to highlight? Well, I wrote it because um, I began writing in, 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 in defense of keeping a Vermont Yankee nuclear plant going here in Vermont. And in, I began a blog about it uh, because it, the positive side didn't seem to be covered in the, the regular press. So anyway, I'm blogging about it. And then these things would come up like, Vermont Yankee not allowed to delist from forward capacity auction. Now I've been in the uh, electric industry most of my life and I'm like, I'm not sure exactly what this means. So I began investigating it, began learning about the grid, how the grid is managed uh, and got asked to be on a a committee at ISO New England uh, about uh, consumer liaison group. Uh, anyway, long and short of it, I realized that most people didn't have a clue about it. I had a beginning of a clue because I knew I'd been working with a, a, a utilities for a long time, but as a chemist, not as somebody who worked about the grid. I'm a chemist. And uh, I thought, you know, this is too important for people not to know about it. And it's also very fragile. The decisions are ma- that are made have nothing to do with reliability. The way they set it up, it it doesn't have anything to do with reliability. And people don't want to talk about that. The buck doesn't stop on any desk at any agency for keeping the grid going. So for example, at one point, um, someone said, uh, well, uh, there's a NERC, National Electricity Reliability Council, that has has rules about the grid. And I said, really? It doesn't seem to keep the grid going. And they said, well, the rules aren't about resource adequacy. Resource adequacy is do you actually have enough electricity to keep the grid growing? That's not something they make rules about. I mean, so the whole thing is such a mishmash of interested parties moving the grid toward what they want, uh, lack of oversight, lack of transparency. You can't even get into the meetings and, and it's all sort of under, under the radar. I mean, I have a friend in Chicago, very educated woman. And I said, uh, I called her at one point and I said, 
you know, I'm writing a book about the grid. I was wondering, how do you like being in that little bit of PJM that's stuck in the middle of MISO? And she was like, the middle of MISO? What, what are you talking about? <laughs> because nobody knows the name of their grid operator. Now we know ERCOT. Everybody knows the name of ERCOT. But I, lots of other places, people simply have never heard of this. None. So let's hone in on the special special interests pushing certain forms of energy generation over others and pushing grids in certain directions. What, what have you found? Uh, where have you found that interest lying and what are their motives, particularly from your perspective? Well, there's two group. Everybody, of course, wants to push their own interests. And the way it's set up with comparatively little oversight for reliability, people are able to push their own interests a lot. But the two groups that I consider to be most successful in pushing their own interests are the uh, renewable groups and the, uh, the natural gas industry. And, and the ones that are least successful would be the um, nuclear groups, the coal groups, and uh, basically that's kind of all there is on the grid. When you get right down to it, it's natural gas, nuclear, uh, renewables, coal. I mean, you know, there, there aren't, a, people say, oh, there's all kinds of stuff on the grid, but really it comes down to Oh, and there's hydro. Of course, there's hydro. But there's only hydro some places. So I tend to, I don't tend to, hydro, there's only hydro some places and hydro isn't expanding. So I don't tend to uh, think much about how the hydro is going. I have to admit that. Yeah, I mean, that's very specific to locality, correct? You yeah, need to have exactly, exactly. water flowing near a near a populous area for that to make any sense at all. Um, yeah. Well, actually, they let water flowing not very near a populous area. You know, over here in Vermont, we get a lot of uh, uh, electricity uh, down on, on big high voltage DC lines from Hydro Quebec. And Hydro Quebec has flooded a lot of Native American lands up there to make very big reservoirs. So, it, you know, uh, they, they've improved their relationship with the, uh, with the indigenous people. They have improved it. But when they started out, the indigenous people said, we didn't know a dam was going in until it, we saw the bulldozers. It's very funny. The, the Bitcoin mining community has a very interesting history with Hydro-Quebec specifically. So Hydro-Quebec uh, was overproducing power, like, in, like I think gigawatts worth of power uh, at their power, power station. And they invited Bitcoin miners in to come uh, use that excess capacity to, to mine Bitcoin at very cheap rates. And a bunch of miners came on that hydrogen Quebec grid or the grid that they were selling to and plopped their miners down and were using the electricity very cheaply, built up very sizable mining operations. And then one day Quebec, for some reason or another, uh, wanted to pick on Bitcoin miners specifically and, and raise the rates for those miners. So you had people invest a bunch of capital and infrastructure and, and buildings and, and capacity to take on that excess energy that Hydro-Quebec was producing. And they built these sizable mining operations that were very profitable because the, the excess energy was cheap. And then once they were locked in, Quebec and Hydro-Quebec raised their prices to the point of unprofitability and they had to quickly uh, shut down on those mining uh, operations there. And there was a lot of politics and favor uh, basically the, the Quebec, the province and hydro Quebec picking favorites of who was, uh, using their, their electricity and, and basically pin pinpointing Bitcoin miners saying, Hey, we're going to make it more expensive for you. Well, you know, I, uh, I'm not, I, I mean, I don't want to just point fingers to one company or another, but I, I, whatever, I'm not particularly surprised at hydro Quebec being, um, you know, unpredictable, <laughs> or maybe predictable. Uh, when I started, remember, I started blogging about Vermont Yankee and 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 the local grid. And uh, one, uh, we had a, in 2013, 2014, approximately, we had a polar vortex. It was very, very cold, and uh, the grid was stressed, and also for. And I was watching this, and the first thing I noticed was that Hydro Quebec 
was sending us about half the amount of power that it did in other times. I mean, things were desperate around here. There were places that were turning on diesel generators with like jet fuel. I mean, there were frozen coal piles. There was all kinds of stuff going on. And all of a sudden they're sending us less. And I thought, whoa, that's interesting. And it turns out later as I got to learn more about the grid and uh, especially in 2018 when there was another uh, polar thing and once again, Hydro-Quebec was sending us less power. I discovered that Hydro-Quebec had actually not promised to send us all the power that it sends usually. It had only promised that is it had taken on a capacity supply obligation for about half the power that it usually sends. So anytime it needed the rest, no foul on them. They just say, okay, we're, we're living up to our capacity obligation. You want more, you're used to getting more. Well, that's unfortunate. Uh, and, and, and it's because they needed the power at home. And this was my first real understanding, I, I talked about different ways grid fa grids fail in the book. And one of the ways is over dependence on the neighbors. Like everybody just slammed Texas. Texas didn't want to be connected to its neighbors. <clears throat> if Texas had been connected to its neighbors, everything would have been great. No, the neighbors were having the same trouble. They weren't going to be exporting a lot of things. They didn't have as dramatic a trouble as, as Texas did, because Texas actually had four days of blackouts, while the neighbors only had 20-minute usual. Well, the ones I know about were 20-minute rolling blackouts every two or three hours. So the, the neighbors weren't having the kind of problems Texas was having, but they were having problems enough that they weren't going to ship a lot of power to Texas. <laughs> And and similarly, when hydro, when a lot of people in in Quebec heat with with electricity because it's very cheap up there, and when they needed the heat and Hydro Quebec didn't have enough electricity to send to New England, New England didn't get it. We if it's lousy weather and the pe you can't just count on your neighboring grid to take care of you before they take care of their own uh, uh, customers. And that's one of the ways the grid is fragile. Yeah, and that should be common sense, right? Like you need to take care of your own before you you branch out, especially in emergency times, if you will, right? Yes. You, you work from inside but, out. But a lot of people would have have said that one of Texas's problems wasn't connected to the neighboring grids if it had only been connected. No. It was cold all over the place. The neighboring grids were having their own problems. What I'm saying is I remember at the beginning, I began talking about this resource adequacy, which is kind of a buzzwordy thing. But when you get right down to it, resource adequacy means, do you have enough electricity to meet peak demand? Do you have it? And basically, you got to have it on your own grid. You can't count on the neighbors. Now, you understand that doesn't mean I feel that every person ought to have a little, you know, generator and then they're their own grid and whatever. What I mean is if you've got a region of the country, you shouldn't count on neighboring regions that have their own grids and their own rules and their own constraints to make it up to you when things are tough. Yeah, I mean, you're... you're you're highlighting fragility. Like one thing we talk about in the Bitcoin world, particularly about making sure the network is robust and resilient enough against state attacks is having enough full nodes, full Bitcoin nodes, passing the rules and the transactions uh, along to each other geographically dispersed around the world. If you don't have enough nodes, it's a lot easier to shut down. The more nodes you have, the more anti-fragile the system is. The more modularized it is, the more anti-fragile it is. And it seems like with grids, we need to apply a very similar logic to how we're delivering electricity to people in localities. We need to build up the capacity uh, and, and not be reliant on neighbors as you've been describing. And I think this may be a good time to jump into Texas specifically and what led to their unreliable grid during this polar vortex. Why, did not, why didn't they have resource adequacy? Did they think they may have because of wind and solar, the amount of electricity that was being produced by those sources. But once you have a black swan event like this hundred year storm that, that freezes up turbines and makes cloud cloud cover so that you're not able to actually produce the, the solar electricity you may have 
wanted during peak demand. Uh, were these factors? Was it a push towards an over-reliance on these unreliable sources of energy and wind and solar and uh, a second tiering of natural gas, nuclear, other sources? Well, the way I, I look at it and uh, is that there are three things that work together to make a grid reliable, unreliable. And uh, the first thing is you have over-reliance on renewables that go on and off at their own schedule, not connected with demand. So for example, the wind in Texas had been like, I don't know, 30%, 40% of the grid uh, energy uh, before this event happened. And then when the event happened and it got cold, the wind died down. And then it was like 8% of the grid energy. So 25% disappeared very quickly. Now, somebody, a lot of people will say, well, yeah, go ahead and blame renewables, go ahead. But you, you know that the Texas operators didn't really expect the renewables to be that great in the winter anyway. Well, I'm sorry, if you go from 30 something to eight, eight something, or you just drop so much ability to, to, to uh, uh, supply energy, because the wind blows when it wants to blow. Nobody can order up, hey, get another couple of turbines spinning, huh? I mean, you can't do that. Just get a bunch of people out there to blow. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. So, so anyway, so the, the wind wasn't available and no matter how much demand there was on the grid, no matter how bad things were in Texas, you couldn't order it to blow. So that's over-reliance on on the wind. Then I have to say that Texas as a whole has always had what you might call low margins. I, I don't know why people say that it's because they don't have a capacity market, but I don't think that's the whole story. But the, the thing is that the an average grid has uh, tries to keep about what 15% more installed generating capacity than their peak demand. So the idea is that if there's peak demand, then you will still meet it even if 10% of your plants are down for the count for some reason. You see, that's the reserve margin. Texas has always run with the skinniest reserve margins you, in, in the whole of the United States. It's It's been like, uh, if you if you follow these things, if you read uh, Utility Dive or, or uh, the trade magazines, you know, at the beginning of every summer, they say, despite reserve margins that are less than 8% or less than 6% in Texas for this season, the grid operator is confident of their ability to meet demand. You know, everybody else is running like, despite... With our reserve margins of 15%, we're confident in this Texas, despite reserve margins of less than 10%, we're, you know, so they never have really had the, the margins they should have had. And then um, the other thing is that they were very, very dependent on natural gas. Now, I think natural gas is a lovely fuel. I think nuclear is better. But what I want to say is that one thing about nuclear is that when you uh, when you do a fuel load in a nuclear reactor, you've got enough fuel for 18 months. Whatever else is going to happen, for example, uh, the grid goes down so the nuclear reactor has nowhere to send its power, so it has to go down. Things can happen. So that mean the nuclear reactor isn't operating, but it won't stop operating because it's out of fuel, because it's got the fuel. It's got 18 months of fuel. That's what, that is what the great um, insight that uh, Hyman Rickover had was, we can, <laughs> these submarines can stand her a long time. I mean, you know, we would never have, have, have have eliminated the German wolf packs, except that they had to come up and 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 run their diesels in order to go down again. So uh, the, there's the German subs. So at any rate, I guess what I'm saying is that natural gas is not stored at the power plant. 
it is shipped to the power plant by pipeline. And it will get to the power plant by pipeline if a whole bunch of conditions are met. First of all, there's enough natural gas to put in the pipeline. That's usually the case, but sometimes wells freeze in these bad, I mean, and they don't work well, okay? Another thing is that the pipeline can deliver natural gas to the power plants. You say, well, I don't know, what's, that? what's the difference about that? Natural gas deliveries are prioritized for homes. So if you're having a cold snap and all of a sudden everybody that used to run their heater for about an hour in the morning is running it 24 seven and running it at high heat, you know, because it, they need the heat because it, they're not used to this kind of cold snap, then that natural gas that's being burned in that home isn't making it to a power plant. So the power plant may not be able to get natural gas. And uh, so those are the two just in time. Oh, and of course, I, I have to say, there can be compressor pay failures, there can be all kinds of other valve failures, there can be all sorts of other things that prevents the natural gas from getting to the power plant. And unlike a uh, nuclear plant or even a coal plant, there's no natural gas sitting around there at the power plant to be burned. So if you're dependent first on, on renewables that go on and off when they want to, and second, on natural gas, which is delivered just in time, assuming it's available and it hasn't been diverted to homes and none of the valves are frozen and so forth. And third, oh, well, if we're in trouble, the neighbors will help. This is not, not going to be a happy story. No. And it seems like common sense what you're describing here. It should be common sense and particularly around the conversation with nuclear. So that's one thing that hopped onto my radar a couple of months ago. Again, so Bitcoin mining, we don't have to jump into like the particulars, but I think it helps add some context to this conversation. Bitcoin mining is seen as an evil in the world because it uses a lot of electricity to produce the hashes and allow people to add blocks of transactions to the Bitcoin ledger for this digital ledger that, that we're creating, this right. distributed digital ledger. The the energy density of the, the machines, the ASICs that uh, produce the hashes that allow miners to add blocks to the blockchain take a lot of energy. But what you'll find is Bitcoin miners, uh, they, they find stranded energy sources, typically hydroelectric, wind or solar that has overcapacity. In our case, the Great American Mining, we go into oil fields and we find uh, producers that are flaring gas and we say, hey, don't flare that gas. Let's run it through generators, produce electricity and actually get some value out of this gas. A couple months ago, uh, a woman in, in California took, and I think this highlights perfectly how most individuals just, number one, don't understand how grids work or how energy is delivered. She took a bunch of pictures of Bitcoin mining warehouses from around the world, one in Kazakhstan, one in upstate New York, both using hydroelectric, one in uh, China, I believe maybe that was coal powered, and, and another one that was somewhere else in, in Eastern Europe. She was a Californian, and she posted those four pictures on on her Twitter with a tweet that said, "We're having rolling blackouts here in California, and all these Bitcoin miners are are using so much energy." And, oh, and, oh my God, they stole your energy from California. Yeah, well, this is legitimately what this woman thought, and it was like, "Oh my gosh, you don't understand." And what's ironic about it is the the impetus for the rolling blackouts in California is the fact that they decommission natural gas power plants and nuclear power plants. They didn't replenish that power generation. And, and, and people were quote tweeting, retweeting what she tweeted and saying, we need to bomb all the, the Bitcoin mining facilities in the world because it's using too much energy. Like all these people in California are having blackouts and Bitcoin miners are using, using this energy. And it, it just highlights how disconnected a lot of the people talking about this and screaming about it are, are from reality of how this stuff actually works. Yes. And, and like the, the grid fragility in California was because they decommissioned power plants and didn't replenish the power generation. And yet people don't understand this, which should be very f fundamental and rudimentary uh, concept of, of how energy is produced and delivered to localities. You know, they, they really, they don't understand it. I remember when, um, when uh, 
people were going to, uh, there were a bunch of people marching around with signs saying shut down Vermont Yankee nuclear plant and so forth and so on. And, and, and then uh, someone would say, well, how are you going to replace the power? And they'd say, oh, there's plenty of power on the grid. What does that mean? Uh, what kind of power? I, I, are you planning to run the natural gas plants more, which is actually what happened? Uh, I mean, what, you know, they, they, they just say on the grid, it's on the grid, it's like floating around on the grid. And it's one of these things where people have somehow uh, disconnected themselves from what reality, I, I, I mean, I'm sorry, the power plant, power isn't on the grid, there's something making the power. If you shut down one thing that makes the power, hopefully you have something else that will fill in. If you shut down too many things that are making the power, they may not be able to fill in. What's left may not be able to fill in. That's what happened in California. Yeah. And so why, why do people demonize? So there, there's a couple of things I want to go. Why are people demonizing nuclear when we should like, so that's the other thing. What are the intentions of these people pushing us towards these unreliable renewables and wind and solar particularly? So in Texas, you had Rick Perry, George Bush, which had a bunch of special interests behind them pushing their grid and subsidizing wind and solar generation in favor of natural gas and other sources. Uh, in California, I'm sure it was political why they decommissioned the nat gas and the nuclear power plants. Similarly, in Vermont, uh, I believe I believe there's also another nuclear power plant that's being decommissioned in the New York area as well. In the New York area, not in Vermont, in New York, uh, uh, on the Hudson River near New York City. I'm mm -hmm. not terribly near, but closer than from, to Vermont. So that, that's the thing that perplexes me about nuclear specifically. So if you're going to if you're going to appease the idea that we need to move to reliable or excuse me, renewable energy sources solely to save the planet um, from, from a climate emergency, why d does everybody not push toward nuclear? Why only wind and solar? Like it seems like nuclear is demonized despite the fact that it's the most energy dense uh, resource that we have on the planet and most reliable that we have on the planet and would be the cleanest in terms of, uh, not actually producing CO2 um, from the construction of the power plants to the, the delivery of the energy when you compare that to how you m m basically dig for cobalt, coal, and other precious and rare earth metals and have to like, get them get them to very high degrees uh, Fahrenheit via fossil fuels to build wind and solar um, power generation sources. Well, that's a really big important question. And um, I would say that, uh, that there's two factors. There's first the sort of um, the sort of virtue factor. The idea is that if you, you're against nuclear, then you're against nuclear everything. You're against nuclear war, you're against nuclear submarines, you're against nuclear, you know, in other words, you're just a real, you're a person who really wants the world to be a beautiful place with none of this worry stuff going on in it. Unfortunately, uh, the wanting that doesn't make it happen. But uh, I, I think that's one of the, it's, it's like credentials for being in favor of peace and love and 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 green fields that don't use uh, fertilizers and uh, it's it's an idealistic view of the world. Uh, on the other hand, there's also money behind it. <laughs> to be blunt about it, I mean, if you look at um, there are very few studies I was able to find. I find, finally found a couple that look at what happens when you add uh, renewable energy to grids. And it said that basically, if you add one megawatt of renewable energy of the kind that comes and goes when it wants to, okay, that is wind and solar, um, then you have to add a little more than one megawatt a fast acting response. And what is the only fast acting response you can add? It's a, it's a gas turbine. That's it. 
every time you add a, 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 a renewable, you're adding a gas turbine. And uh, of the same size. So that's a big market for natural gas. So you see, if you can convince people that nuclear is bad and you're going to do renewables, then you know that they're going to have to add the gas turbines or they're going to have to have major uh, uh, blackouts going on when, when, when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. So they're going to have to add the gas turbines and they're going to, have to be able to sell a lot of natural gas. So despite uh, New York State's uh, great uh, plans, for example, uh, for um, uh, a renewable future and, and, and we're shutting down Indian Point, a uh, big, big nuclear station, and we're going to have a celebration when it closes and all that kind of stuff, what you actually have is three new natural gas plants have been built within about a hundred miles of Indian Point. Why are they celebrating this though? What is their... Well, they've been fighting to close it for a long time. Some of the people, I mean, and they get these wild names. I mean, you know, sometimes I think that they, 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 uh, they want to live in a world, uh, written by Tolkien. And what I mean, <laughs> mean by that is, um, if uh, there's this group that's been fighting Indian Point forever, and uh, and uh, they're called River Keeper, you know, they are they are the keepers of the river, and they have like names of their officers that's sort of like River Keeper too. And it's very very. I, I haven't looked up the name. Pete uh, Pete Seeger was very active in that group. But do they have data about pollution emanating from the site? Is it, you know, is it the potential they, for pollution? Like, what is? They don't, they don't have data about pollution from the site. I don't think they could actually find such data, but they do have other data that they 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 can use. For example, they say you realize that the uh, there's no leakage of 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 radioactivity in this matter, but we have cooling water that comes from the Hudson River. And in order to use the cooling water, it has to go through a screen so that little, um, little animals and stuff don't go into any of the cooling circuits and so forth. And those screens kill uh, baby fish or uh, fish eggs or whatever. And they kill billions of them. Don't you realize they kill billions of them? And the answer is, of course, they kill billions of them. Every fish lays thousands of eggs. I mean, <laughs> anything. And, and I, I actually did a little research study on this. And you know what the most dangerous thing for fish eggs is? Other fish. Other fish like to eat fish eggs. I mean, it's a great source of protein. You've got to ban all fish. <laughs> So, so, you know, they can go around saying, we'll have our Hudson back. There won't be all these fish dying. Well, not, not real living fish, but, but little tiny baby fish and fish fry and, uh, you know. But, uh, well, so I had Alex Epstein on the, the podcast uh, about a month ago. He's very pro fossil fuels, wrote the book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. And I've been uh, on his podcast. I know him. Yeah, he's. I think what you what you guys are doing is incredible because it like really highlights the fact that these hysterics, these alarmists, are anti-human. And they're like, yes, like maybe it is killing some fish eggs that could potentially have hatched and become fish, but that stuff works itself out. There's there's not zero fish in the Hudson. Like it hasn't <laughs> destroyed all the fish, and you should be more worried about what's going into the Hudson around New York City and Manhattan uh, compared to what's going up. Uh, upstate New York, but it's really anti-human because they're going to decommission this power plant to raise electricity prices, which is going to hurt the poor the most. And there, there could be externalities, negative externalities of potentially poor people dying because they get priced out of electricity. Well, yes. And, and I, I'm afraid that there's a tendency among the um, people who are most concerned with the outside environment to not even see poor people. Oh, they say things about, oh, the most vulnerable, we've got to protect the most vulnerable, whatever. But when you get right down to it, I mean, I had this conversation with this woman one time, and um, 
I said, and 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 and, and uh, uh, she has a reasonably high position. Uh, and I said, you know, raising electricity prices, it really, it really hurts people. Uh, it can hurt people. And she said, oh, electricity is a very small portion of the average household's uh, uh, costs. I mean, I don't think raising prices of electricity by 20% or something is really going to make that much difference. And I thought, the average household costs in your household and in my household because I'm a retired chemist and I worked for years and years in, 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 in high tech and my husband did and I, we're not rich, don't get me wrong. But yes, we have a paid off house and we have you know social security and he has a small pension. And so, yeah, for us, people like us, anyway yeah 20 percent increase in a one part of your 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 monthly expenses is material for a lot of people i think if, if you want to it's, increase material. it's terribly material for a lot of people 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 do all kinds of things to avoid uh, a high cost electricity and some of these things are not are, are not are not good i mean especially for older people i'm an old person and i know youthful in spirit though yeah youthful in spirit but what i'm trying to say is that i know that i used to be able to read if there was a little bead of light in the room somewhere nowadays man i want one of those you know i mean it's an led bulb and stuff I, it's got to be bright or i'm just going to be like what is this and that is something that happens to older people. I mean, even if you don't have, um, you know, some eye problem, some diagnosable eye problem, older people need more light to read, for example. And, and, and the, the, there's an assumption, people like us, people like us, it doesn't, the cost of this doesn't matter. People like, but, but not everybody is people like us. I mean, I, I, I mean, I was, you know, talking to this woman and, and, and she does, uh, uh, and, and she talked about how her boss was late eight days in paying her and it was just this big crisis because a lot of people who are working very hard, eight days is a big crisis. Yeah, I mean, there's the stat that's been throwing out a lot recently, uh, in recent years, something like 40% of Americans couldn't afford a $400 emergency expense without extending a line of credit or using a credit card if they needed to. People are living hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck on the hamster wheel. Yes, I, I, I know. And you, what you really don't want to do is make it worse by raising the cost of energy. For, for people. First of all, you raise the cost for them. And secondly, you raise you raise the cost for all sorts of things. And, and then it gets reflected back to them. I mean, energy goes into so many things that if you raise the cost of energy, you're raising the cost of everything else. All of a sudden, oh, oh the electricity bill, uh, electricity is more expensive. Okay. How does that affect your supermarket that has a freezer? Is it, is it going to have to raise some prices at the supermarket? Because uh, is it only going to raise prices at the, at the freezer stuff? I don't think so. The supermarket's going to figure out where to raise prices to make its overhead. And it's not going to be like, oh, I, we're, we're really going to be doing this uh, in a matter of equity. The poor people don't buy frozen food, so we'll raise only frozen food prices. That's not it. They're going to they're gonna look at what their expenses are, and they're going to raise their prices to meet the expenses. Why can't people so that like me personally? I I get my head spinning. I'm like, what is what is the agenda behind this? Do, do these people really care about helping the environment, or do they just want to control other humans, particularly what energy sources they use? Is it a bunch of people who just don't like that they don't have control with how the world works, and this is their vector through which they can force control? Well, you know, I don't tend to th I'm, think badly of people's motivations because if I begin doing that, then life gets to be very, very unpleasant. I, for me, I mean, uh, I feel 
that people are actually frightened of how out of control they see the world. And they, they in other words, they, you know, how many people really want to know how that there was a piece of space junk that killed all the dinosaurs and there's no reason a piece of space junk couldn't do the same to us? You don't want to know that. A lot of the world is not in our control. I mean, uh, and then, you know, it's a very frightening thought. When you get right down, it's a very frightening thought. And so there's a feeling that if we're good enough, if we're, you know, virtuous enough, then maybe these bad things won't happen to us. I mean, in a way, I, the the Greeks, for example, I there are a lot of things I really don't like about the culture of ancient Athens. But one thing is that they would say things like "the good die young." In other words, they didn't think that you know you could protect yourself from the bad things in the world simply by virtue. Virtue was to be done for its own reasons. Virtue was to be done because you were a philosopher, a stoic, a good husband, a good, a, a good daughter, whatever. It wasn't about now things will be good for me. And unfortunately, I think we have, we have gotten to the point that people protect themselves mentally from the uncertainties of the world by saying, well, I'm going to be really, really good and nothing bad will happen to me. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's so many ways I could take this particular. This is a conversation on my other podcast, Tales from the Crypt, which is specifically about Bitcoin, that we touch on this a lot. The idea of elite overproduction. And so something that's sort of tangential to the line of thinking that, that you just expounded upon is this idea of elite overproduction, where last generation, last 30, 50 years of people, of my generation specifically, I'm 29, t- told since we were in middle school, you got to go to college. This is the path that you have to take on life. You have to get a degree. That's how you get a good job. That's how you separate yourself from the lazy of the world. And you, you, you build yourself up and get a, enough financial backing that you can, you, you can separate yourself from the working class. Not, not implicitly said, but that was uh, excuse me, not explicitly said, but that's what it's implied with the the notion that if you go to school, get a degree, get a good job, you can make a better life for yourself. Well, we flooded the university system, which was enabled by the access to cheap loans. Uh, and everybody in my generation got a degree. And so they're expecting uh, to be able to separate themselves, particularly from the working class financially. And they're expecting to get a, a degree that gets them a job, that gets them a salary, that gets them to the next rung of the economic ladder and just due to the flooding of people into the university system and the overproduction of degrees you have this concept of elite overproduction where the people my generation mainly who were fed this idea throughout our whole lives have gotten their degree they're in the job market and they're looking around they're like wait a second i'm not making any more money than uh the working class that i was told i would be above in this economic status game that we play in the world and so since they can't separate themselves uh with economic with economics with fin- financially they have to separate themselves morally and virtuously and so that's why you see this onslaught of virtue signaling of oh I, i'm better than the working class the the rust belt trump trump voter because i have these virtues and they don't and that's how we separate ourselves now is with these virtues that aren't back in reality which is scary at the end of the day yeah, that, that, that's another thing. You know, that's one of the things that Alex Epstein talks a lot about. And like, uh, well, I don't know that he talks about this specifically, but a virtue is only a virtue in a value system. Okay. I mean, uh, th- there's a value system, and then you behave according to that value system, and then you are virtuous. The thing is that the virtue, the value system isn't about uh, uh, people thriving anymore. It's about, as, as Alex Epstein says, It's about not affecting nature. But when you get right down to it, what affects nature the least is nuclear. I mean, it takes the lowest amount of land. It takes the lowest amount of mining. I mean, you know, it it makes the least amount of pollution. And uh, and yet it... um, 
See, that's, <laughs> that's what leads me to believe that these people don't actually care about renewable energy. They care about control. Because if they did care, they'd be championing nuclear as loud and as vociferously as they could. Well, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about one anti-nuclear person. Uh, I don't know, I'm, examples, I guess there are tons of examples. But this one, I was debating him. And it was Big Hall debating this guy. And uh, he said that uh, due to the nuclear plant, there, there, there used to be thousands of shad in the uh, Connecticut River, but due to the nuclear plant, there were only seven. He said, not 7,000, seven shad. And I thought, really, you counted them? I mean, people can make the most absurd statements, but they make them for dramatic effect. So it seems to me pretty clear that he really doesn't care that much about the Connecticut River because nobody in their right mind would say that there are seven of a certain kind of fish in the Connecticut River. If you could catch seven, that implies there's some left behind in the river. I mean, the whole thing is so absurd. So uh, I don't know uh, what, you know, the, I think the, the, the other thing is that the, this business of like, we're going to get off fossil fuels, we're going to not do nuclear, we're just going to live in harmony with nature. This uh, all, this all is considered to be very, very virtuous, even if it's completely nonsensical, you know? I mean, people say we're going to get off fossil fuels, okay. Here's Meredith, and she's, she's, you know, getting up in the morning, and she's getting out of bed, and she puts her feet on the floor. And what's on the floor? It's a carpet made with fossil fuels. And then she walks out of, then she walks out of the house, right? And, uh, oh, or she, maybe she puts on a hat. Maybe the hat has some cotton in it. Maybe the hat has some uh, something else in it that may be a, a, a synthetic, you know, because it's supposed to shed rain. Okay, now she's wearing fossil fuels. She's standing on, and now she's walking down her driveway. The driveway is coated with asphalt. She's walking on, she hasn't turned on a single piece of energy equipment yet. She's walking out to get the paper and she's surrounded completely with fossil fuels. And yet people will say, we're gonna dump fossil fuels. It's gonna be easy. It just takes, it just takes the determination, <laughs> like really. It's scary. You have a lot of the, you have the president of the United States pushing us down this direction right now, like very aggressively. Like how do we let these insane people? So that's part of the driving force behind this podcast. Dude. Number one, bridge between Bitcoin mining industry and the energy industry. Number two, we want to speak sense in this world of insanity. Like this is not good. I have a young child. I have a 14 month old son. Like if we barrel down the path that these insane people want us to, his future is very bleak in my mind. And the energy price go up, <laughs> the reduction of electricity production is not good for, for society at large. And I agree. I think it's important to get strong voices like yourself on this platform to begin speaking sense or obviously we may have a some confirmation bias with this particular audience right they may come to get this idea of reinforced in their brains like how do we reach out to the the people pushing down, us down an insane path and have logical conversations around this and, and try to have logic prevail at the end of the day is it possible do they just stick their fingers in their ears and say la 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 i don't want to hear it do we i think that if we could get people to accept progress without these crazy goals for example you might say oh okay we don't want to burn as much fossil fuels there are plenty of reasons to want to not burn as much fossil fuels i i i consider nox production a big problem even when it's, there's abatement techniques uh, um and let's say well let's see if we can make most of our electricity with a combination of uh, nuclear and some renewables and some natural gas, and then we won't be burning as much fossil fuels as we're burning now. 
But you see, the thing is, we have to have that nice base load of nuclear so that we don't have uh, natural gas pretty much for everything if the sun isn't shining, you know? So if we could get people to look at making progress instead of attaining an unattainable goal, a completely unattainable goal, a completely unattainable, you know, uh, slogan. It's not even a goal, it's a slogan. What, and, net zero carbon or? Yeah, net zero. In my opinion, it's more of a slogan than a goal. Yeah, because, it's nonsensical. Because you can't actually get there from here. And, 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 and people will be willing to admit they can't get there from here, okay? I mean, if you really push them, they'll really admit it. They'll say, well, yeah, I know the developing world is going to be using a lot of carbon. Yeah, I know this, I know that. But when you get right down to it, if you could just say, we are going to make progress. But people, people don't understand that making progress is worthwhile. Sometimes I think what you have to do is make sure that everybody takes uh, music lessons and has to work for a couple of years to become competent in something. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for the answer to the energy crisis? Well, I music like that lessons. idea. <laughs> Somebody who played the bassoon growing up, I, I think that's a very, uh, very virtuous goal to set for people. Learn how to read music and work hard towards, towards the goal to create something beautiful, if you will. I think that's virtuous. Yeah. But the thing is, it also teaches you that you can't do it overnight. There's nobody who's, who gets up in the morning, hasn't, hasn't ever seen a bassoon, and, and, and gets first position in the orchestra of a bassoon because they just are so good. No, it takes, it takes persever perseverance. It takes practice. You know, you know the old joke, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Oh, there's a joke. So it's a guy is on the street. One guy is walking down the street in New York, and he he wants to find Carnegie Hall. He doesn't he doesn't know where it is. So he uh, he asks a new a guy who looks like he lives in New York. He says, "Hi, uh, how do you get to Carnegie Hall?" And the guy answers, "Practice, man, practice." <laughs> <laughs> practice, practice makes perfect. It's. <laughs> No, yeah, learning how to blow into the reed, uh, let alone like uh, and reading the bass clef and being able to uh, get like the, the crescendo, the decrescendo down it takes time. It's not easy. You, you got to go through that process. Yeah. Similarly with this stuff, right? And then, and, and that's the other, like another goal to set between here and there. And like, so that's what I think at Great American Mining, we do a very good thing of, of materializing and pushing this goal to the fore, which is be more efficient with the energy sources you're pulling out of the ground, particularly with natural gas, instead of literally lighting it on fire and sending, uh, sending the CO2 to the atmosphere without any economic productivity getting eked out of it. Let's run it through generation equipment, create electricity, and create Bitcoin, which adds positive economic value to the economy you don't even have to hold the bitcoin you can liquidate it right away if you want to do us dollars and that adds to the the gdp of the country and the the production overall of economic value now here I, here we are almost at the end of the hour and i'm going to bring up a question that i I've, I've really thought about so why is bitcoin considered to be so evil and making hydrogen which is much harder to store with excess energy considered to be so virtuous I don't know. Well, I don't, I, again, like I think what we're getting at through the, the conversation that we're having right now is there's nothing is based in logic. It's all emotion and virtue signaling. And I don't, again, I think that elite overproduction, which is forcing a class of people, particularly millennials, to attempt to separate themselves, which they used to do financially, now morally and virtuously is driving them to do insane things that that sound cool and sound virtuous but in reality are the exact opposite they're anti-human they make everybody worse off and uh, people are able to do it from their apartments they can just tweet out using petroleum-based products sending the tweet to a server that consumes a lot of energy and they can virtue signal about this stuff and literally not lift a finger to actually do anything about it other than tweeting or lift a finger to actually understand how any of this works. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and I, I, I would also say that and to, to get back to, since it's the end of the hour and I want people to think about my book a little, I would say getting back to my book, I think that the reason, the, uh, an a deep reason that, that reliability is not, um, is not uh, honored by the uh, many areas of the comp- country that have um, auctions for electricity and so forth and so on. The reason reliability isn't honored is really because people are so busy s- virtue signaling about everything else that they, they don't put things into effect. And, 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 and if a, when reliability isn't honored, then you won't have a reliable grid. People will find ways to maximize their profits that aren't necessarily leading to a reliable grid. And so what, in your mind, are the best steps forward to create more reliable grids? What do we need to do? What do we need to highlight? How, how can we make our grid system more anti-fragile and less fragile? Well, we have to acknowledge that different kinds of fuels have different kinds of uses and not just say every kilowatt hour is the same. A kilowatt hour that's here today, here now and gone in five minutes is worth as much as a kilowatt hour that would be steady for many, many months. Uh, and, and, And we have to acknowledge differences. And, you know, There's this whole idea that the grid is supposed to be fuel neutral, every kilowatt hour is the same. But when you get right down to it, that that can't be. Uh, For example, natural gas is delivered in just in time. Well, you 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 could solve that problem by saying every natural gas plant has to have uh, 24 hours worth of well, the, many natural gas plants can be du- dual fired. They can burn oil and natural gas. And every such plant has to have 24 hours worth of oil on site at the beginning of every winter. You can make a rule of that kind. It would raise prices a little bit, but it would add a lot to reliability. But currently, you can't make that rule because you're supposed to treat all, uh, all fuels equally. So now you're treating oil is better than natural gas. You're treating it better. You're giving it preference to natural gas. And the grid operator isn't supposed to do that. I'm like, this is craziness. You know, there are actually, the fixes for reliability are not actually that hard. Limited amount of renewables, some renewables, yes, absolutely, but not to the point where, where nothing else can make up for them because when they go offline, there's nothing big enough around to take up the slack. Uh, oil storage, if you're going to use a lot of natural gas. I mean, there are, these things are not actually, I, I, I'm making it sound very easy and it isn't as easy as that. And I know that, but it isn't really rocket science either. No, it isn't. What I think we need is more strong voices like yours speaking up, getting out there. And that is, the intention of this podcast. I may cross post this on Tales from the Crypt too, just to get it out to more voices. Meredith, thank you for joining me. It's been an incredible hour. It's been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Thank Uh, you very much. I did as well. And anybody listening to this, if you've not uh, picked up Meredith's book yet, make sure you do so. Shorting the Grid, The Hidden Fragility of Our Electric Grid. Meredith Angwin, everybody. Thank you for joining me. Hope you have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.